of y'all, I'm Alan Hayne, the Lawn Care Nut, and this is episode 20 of Lawns Across America. So welcome back, y'all. Welcome back to episode 20. The summer is now in full swing. This is June, you know, 26, 27, 28, 29, right in there. And the summer is really underway. It's obviously a, it's actually official summer now. As of last weekend, summer solstice, full moon, all kinds of fun stuff. The summer is in full swing. We've been talking about that even in the last podcast, which, by the way, let me just let you know again and apologize. I did miss last week, so now I've actually missed a couple weeks this year already. This past week, my youngest son, the Marine, has been in town. He is in chef school in Chicago now, came down for a visit, and we've been hanging out. We actually took a little hop over to the Bahamas and hung out a little bit this last weekend and just had a good time enjoying summer as we do down here in Florida. We just go further south and get to hotter weather. That's At least that's how I roll. But either way, I'm back now. Things are back rolling. I'm really hoping I can get into a nice summer cadence now and just kind of keep things flowing for you guys, keep the tips moving, and get us ready for fall. I don't want you to think that you can't do anything in summer. You certainly can. You can make progress in summer, especially if you have warm season turf. But really, fall is where the majority of you with cool season turf are going to make your biggest gains. And then sometimes you play a little bit of defense in the summer. So a little bit of this, a little bit of that. However, today what we're going to talk about is something that has come up in multiple areas around the last two weeks for sure. I've seen it on YouTube. I've seen it in my... I've seen it on Facebook, people asking questions, and I've definitely gotten it in emails and over our LCN tips line. By the way, if you do want to call in and ask a question on the podcast, it's 833-LCN-TIPS, 833-LCN-TIPS, LCN tips. Now, we're not going to have a lot of recordings this week because almost all of them were about disease, and so I'm just going to go ahead and do a full episode here, which is mostly going to be about different lawn diseases, lawn funguses, and in this case, we're not going to even talk about how to prevent them anymore for the most part. We're going to talk about what to do when you get them. I don't want to use the word cure because most of these diseases, you actually don't cure. Many of them will just overwinter and can come back out. We'll talk about the disease triangle today. But more than that, it's just help your lawn get through it, help your lawn work its way through and not suffer too much damage along the way. So that's kind of how we're going to go talking about diseases and what you might see and what grasses they affect. And then what are some strategies you can do to help yourself get through the summer as well as I also have an update today. If you guys remember last week I had a, or two weeks ago, I had a call in question from a gentleman in Peoria, in Illinois named Leonard. And Leonard was talking about malorganite splotches. And I gave him some things, some strategies that I thought might help him. And then he's actually responded this week. We did a little bit of follow-up, so I've got something there to talk about that's actually going to relate back to everything in today's podcast, as well as finally we have a Marine that wrote in this week, and that Marine has got his first house, and he's working on getting grass growing on a slope. And so I want to kind of talk a little bit there, because in the community this week, Jake the Lawn Kid actually did some work on our project lawn, which is up in Northwest Indiana, and it is also on a major slope, and he actually solved some problems there that I think will help all of us. So lots in store today, lots to unpack, lots to go over. The first thing, though, I want to talk about, again, are lawn diseases or lawn funguses, because a lot of you guys are going, is it fungi, fungi, fungalinos, yeah, fungalinos, lawn fungalinos, whatever you call them, it's brown spots that are showing up in the lawn, and a lot of times when we see brown spots, depending what you've been reading lately or what you've been doing or where you, what forums you've been hanging out in or what... Whatever your neighbors have been saying, when you see a brown spot, whatever is top of mind is what you will immediately go to. So if you've been reading a lot of things about lawn diseases and you see brown spots on your lawn, it's like normal that you'll go, hmm, must be a fungus, and you start researching fungus in the lawn or disease in the lawn, and you find videos like mine and others, and you're, you're on this like one tunnel vision track that I've got disease, but Maybe not. Now, if you've been watching things on grub worms or you've been watching things on sod web worm or you've been watching videos about insects in the lawn and you see brown spots, then your first tunnel vision might be to go, ah, it must be bugs. And then you just go down the rabbit hole of researching insects and bugs and you start, you know, going, you get what I'm saying, right? So what I want you to do, the first thing you see or the first time you think you'd see disease, and that's what we're talking about today or lawn diseases, is I want you to do nothing. Just chill. Because there are a lot of other things that cause brown spots, and one of the things that we mentioned is insects. Sod webworm can be a challenge as things start to get warmer here in the summer. Some of you may have billbug. I, I don't, you know, that's kind of a late spring thing, I believe. There can be other insect problems, but that's not really the main one. Another thing that could come up that I've seen a lot 
is Poa Trivialis that is just checking out from heat, or Poa Anoa that's literally dying after heat. But usually the Poa Triv will be a little bit later in the season. It'll come back in the fall as things start to cool down again. It probably looked really nice in the spring, and you may not have even realized it in some cases. But that's really going to start to check out as things get hotter and hotter. The Poa Trivialis will check out. And it actually resembles, in some cases, a lawn that is diseased because you'll have Poa Triv that's checking out and turning this yellowish color, but you'll have good Kentucky bluegrass around it. If you've been feeding it and pushing it like I teach, then that Kentucky bluegrass will be dark blue-green, but the rest of that Triv, that Poa Triv that's dying around it or fading, will be yellow and it'll look like a diseased lawn. So that's a case. It can just sometimes just be heat stress. I've talked about that summer hangover or that spring hangover where the lawn's gotten all of this rain. And in fact, I was talking to somebody this week that lives outside of Chicago and he said, wow, we finally are getting warm now. I'm like, geez, dude, it's almost July 1st and you got to say you're finally getting warm. Must be a cool year up there, but lots of rain, lots of cool temps, lots of cloud cover, which can contribute to disease. But sometimes what that is, is all of a sudden the sun comes out and you get three or four days in a row and it's over 85. And I'm going to tell you that right now, all cool season grass stresses over 85. Doesn't mean you're going to see it all the time if you have deep roots, but it's definitely stressed. It doesn't like it over 85. So you got a lawn where the roots are fat, sassy and happy. Kentucky bluegrass, which doesn't by nature does not have a deep root system anyway, unlike turf type tall fescue, which does have a deeper root system. But that Kentucky bluegrass gets hung over and the hot weather hits it and boom, it stunts and it can even go a steely gray and into a brown color and it'll happen in splotches and that can sometimes mimic disease. Even one that I've seen recently far, far north was somebody that their lawn just was at going to seed like literally 10 days ago. Seems late for me or to me, but again, I'm way down here in Florida, but people way up north in the Dakotas and that their lawns may have just gone to seed. And that's a very normal thing for cool season lawns to go to seed. But those lawns going to seed, those, those stalks, when you cut them, they get rough and the stalks will turn yellow too as they die off or as they subsur subside, subseed, subsurd melt, whatever they do, they, they go away. They can be yellow and they can also not, they don't cut well. And those areas where you had thick seed stalks from your good grass going to seed, which is a normal thing, those can look yellow. So that's what I'm saying. When you first approach a disease in this case or a fungal approach strategy, the first thing you want to do is do nothing and consider all of your options. And then the other thing I recommend you do after you consider these options is look at what you've applied. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that coming up, but if you applied a disease control, a preventative like a Scott's Disease X, if you applied that before conditions were favorable for disease, we're going to talk about the disease triangle, or before you even saw the disease, and now you have this giant outbreak, I'm going to tell you I don't think it's disease because these products work. Now, you could go back and understand if there was application error involved, and that's why I always say have a property map, understand your square footage, understand how much pounds on the ground of a product you used. So you can go back and review that. That's why I say keep a laundry. You can see how all this just relates. I'm rambling here. But the idea is to use the data points that you can get. Obviously, a lot of Googling is important. Go to university extension websites. University, or is it NC State? They have a great, uh, what do they call it, turf files? Yeah, Chris Elms, I think, has shouted out to me before that he's an alum of NC State. They have great turf files. Purdue University, first class all the way. I really like University of Florida for warm season. NC's got both. There are a lot of others, but always go to university extension websites because you're going to get the most conservative, concise, and up-to-date information there. They're not going to talk about slinging and, and bringing chemicals for sure. And In fact, most of them try to talk homeowners out of that. And that's good. You want that perspective when you're identifying a problem. So that's what I would ask you to do is to chill. The second thing I would ask you to do then is to look at your neighbors. Are you the only one or does everybody have this problem or is it only in certain lawns? And then see what you can get there. Is it primarily something in lawns that were just sodded last year versus mine that was sodded six years ago? If you're in a new construction area or sodded versus seeded or you know shade versus sun uh, in-ground irrigation versus no irrigation. You know, you kind of look at some of the things that you can see. Also look at common areas. If you're in a subdivision that has common areas, those are usually going to be on a real like standard. I don't want to use the co word cookie cutter necessarily, but a standard program. You know, you got to know what you do. I mean, I'm not involved in my HOA, but I know what they do out there. And I watch the common areas and I know how they're cared for. They are definitely 
professionally cared for. They're professionally manicured with sharp mower blades and things like that, right, that don't contribute to disease. So we're going to talk about a lot of different things, but look at other areas around you and see what data points you can grab from there. And of course, if you have neighbors that are DIYers that you can talk to, I definitely recommend that you share information. So that's the first thing to do when you're starting to go down that path of identifying a disease in the lawn and how you might care for it. The next thing I would recommend that you do is don't get in this syndrome or don't get in this mindset of, gee, I worked so hard on my lawn this spring and now I got this major disease problem. But my neighbor over there, he doesn't do anything to his lawn and he doesn't have the disease. Definitely don't let yourself get put into that. And I'm, I'm helping out my lawn professional friends here right now because this was one of the biggest things we would get, or not biggest, but this was one of the biggest annoyances or, or yeah, I guess it would be a rebuttal annoyance. I don't know what it would be, but when, when, when customers were unhappy, they would call in and often say, I'm paying you for all this service, but my neighbor doesn't do anything to his lawn and his looks way better than mine. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that is. And as a lawn professional, you could never explain that to a customer because that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. When a customer says that to you, they've already known that they knock out all of the options in their own mind as to rebuttal that you could bring. But the truth of the matter is a lot of times, and what I wanted to say to those people was, yeah, because you don't necessarily know what your neighbor does or doesn't do because you're not even doing your own. You don't mow your own lawn. You don't treat your own lawn. You don't even water your own lawn. So how do I expect that you don't do anything at your lawn? You have no observation of your own. Do I really think you're observing your neighbor's lawn? No, you're not. You don't even observe, observe your own. Well, unless that's you, maybe you're observing your neighbor's wife too and not yourself. And yeah, you can see I got I got, I got a lot of angst built up over some of those customer messages. So those are some of the things I've always wanted to say to people. But the truth of the matter is, let's just say that it is a true statement that you have been doing a lot for your lawn, working on it really hard, and your neighbor who does nothing, and let's say that's a true statement that your neighbor does nothing, and he doesn't have the disease and you do. Well, you want to know why? Because it doesn't show. I want you to imagine an unhealthy human being. Let's take someone that's majorly compromised with some bad diseases, maybe like, not even bad diseases. Let's take somebody that's majorly compromised by bad health, malnutrition. Um, let's say they don't brush their teeth, so they have really bad mouth health, which goes into your gut and contributes to all kind of other problems. Let's say they don't, their, their malnutrition leads to high blood pressure, diabetes, and all these things. They get disease. But you'll see that person walking around at the mall laughing, drinking beer, eating a ho-ho, and be like, that dude has a great life. But inside, he's just tore up from the floor up. The thing is, he's just worked through it. He just makes it work. Is he healthy? No. Do you want to be like him? No. Does he contract other diseases? Yeah, but he's so compromised in everywhere else. It all just looks the same. It all just looks like this unhealthy dude. So yeah, of course he doesn't get the disease. But really, he does. You just don't see it because he's so compromised. And by the way, someone like that, when they do get a major you know, health problem, they don't bounce back nearly as quickly. Whereas your lawn that you've been working on, it's exactly the opposite. You're hyper vigilant now. And maybe you're caring, you, maybe you're trying to help it recover from some terrible eating habits over the last 20 or 30 years or however old your house is. And this year you started working on it and you've seen gains, right? This is about starting a workout program. You've seen gains, but you're going to hit plateaus every once in a while. Or sometimes, You'll have to reap what you sow in your past consequences, and if and if and if you, you know, well, I'm using these human human anal analogies pretty quick here. But if you drank for 20 years straight and smoked, yeah, you might have a little lingering emphysema and a little bit of problems with your liver. Even though now you're on a on a, on a health kick and you're doing well and you're doing much much better for sure. And I want you to keep doing better with that lawn, but you might have to have some of those consequences come back to haunt you, you know. But with a lawn, the good news is things are repairable, pretty much 100%. So that's the good news there. I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole, but I hope you'll get the idea. I always try to just get you guys to think about things a little differently because sometimes when these brown spots and these patches come up or these diseases, people literally panic. It's like everything I've done is going to be lost now. Everything I've worked for was for naught. It was a waste. And no, you just need to realize that while I want you to get some wins, and that's my first goal for all of you is to get some wins, which is why I use tell you to use organic fertilizer, sling it down heavy your first couple times, see some results. I want you to get some wins there. 
Those wins are going to help you to get more wins when the losses come, when, when things are not so easy like now. The thinking process behind it, the idea that you have confidence in making an application in general should help you get through these times. So look at these like challenges that, yes, you will overcome because, by the way, there's no lawn that can't be salvaged. And by the way, you don't have to burn every lawn down. I am not a fan of burning lawns down. We're going to talk a lot about that in the coming fall. We're going to work on strategies that are not about burning the lawn down. And I have never preached that, that I remember. Somebody could call me, will call me out <laughs> if I have, but I think I've always talked and I definitely know now I don't want lawns burned down. I'd rather you work with what you have. So hopefully that was a little bit of encouragement to you. We'll see in the edit if I keep all that in or if I got a little bit too dark. I don't think I did. But the next thing I want to do then when we've kind of weighed our options, we've looked at all these things, you've gathered what data points that you have and that you can gather, and you've gotten your psyche, psyche right, you know, you're, you're going out to attack this in the right way. The next thing is, let's just describe the disease triangle and let's think about why do diseases happen. So the disease triangle is something we've talked about before, but basically there are three things, three legs of a stool that have to all come together in order for a disease to manifest or a fungus to manifest itself in the lawn. And the first one is you have to have a proper host. And in this case, the turf grass is the host. Now, sometimes the ho it's hosted or the, the fungal spore or fungal pathogen is hosted in the thatch layer of the turf. Sometimes it's it, it hangs out around the crown, sometimes in the roots, sometimes in the soil. But either way, the turf grass itself will be the host. The second thing you need is the pathogen to be present, which we just mentioned. And the pathogen is mostly going to be present in most places. There will be some pathogens present. It's just a matter of if these other elements come together. And also, is your lawn healthy and vigorous enough to just get through it? You know, a lot of times you're exposed to um, things in the air, a virus or, or bacteria that will make some people sick, but others don't get sick. Um, think about if you go to certain other countries and they'll say, don't drink the water, right? Well, some people can drink the water and they're fine. Other people can't drink the water because they can't overcome that and they'll get the issue or the problem. Well, that's the same exact kind of thing with the lawn. In some cases, the lawn is just healthy enough to withstand and overcome. And that's why keeping a healthy, vigorous lawn is important. And we'll talk about nitrogen fertilization as well and how that relates to disease because people have this whole like either or, all or none kind of thing when it comes to that. Nevertheless, the third piece that you need is the environment, and this is the one that starts to kick in, and I talk about seasonal transition time. So the environment has to be right for that disease to be able to multiply, and typically that's going to be something around the lines of a seasonal transition, so coming from very warm to cool or from coming from cool to warm, and then also it will be coming from rain into dry periods or from dry periods into rain, and all of these work differently. And then other things can contribute too, like humidity for sure can contribute, cloud cover, which restricts airflow. These are all things that can all contribute to the environment coming together. And then a third, another one that we sometimes neglect is mechanical injury can also add to the environment and allow the disease to manifest or get into the plant more readily. So those are all the different things of the disease triangle that you want to look at. And if you have not had those, those types of... Um, elements, those three elements come together, then you may not have a disease. So it's another thing to think about. But that's what the disease does. So one of the things we want to do is we want to reduce some of that environment. So can we create airflow? Can we not spread the spores? And that's why we talk about next. There are some certain things that I want you to do, no matter what disease you think your lawn has, you definitely want to make sure that you are starting to follow these when you do think you have a disease. And the first one is with your mowing. You definitely want to catch the clippings. And I know I used to think about that, and people we, we would say it when I worked for True Green, and I knew people weren't going to do it, you know, but but we can as DIYers. And I used to think, does it really matter? Does catching the clippings really matter? Is it really going to solve my problem? I, 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 I kind of looked at it like, you know, that's especially in real bad disease problems, I'd be like, it's kind of like throwing a lawn chair off the Titanic. I mean, is it really going to make a big difference? The answer is yes. Even a small amount of of best practice can go a long way for the future, especially when it comes to mowing and the way that these spores are spread. Some are spread because like in the case of rust disease, which we're not going to talk about today, but it'll stick to things and fall off. Or in the case of uh, brown patch, which we will talk about, I've seen it follow water. Wherever the water runs through the lawn, the disease will follow there. So if it's only following in those types of areas and you pick it up with your lawnmower as it's mulching and throw it out or side discharge, blow it other places, you could be moving the disease in a way that it wouldn't normally move. 
There are a lot of different things. So the answer is yes. Catch those clippings when disease is present. The other thing is don't mow the turf when it's stressed. One of the biggest mistakes I make with my St. Augustine grass is I like to get out early in the morning and I like to mow it in the morning to, to, to beat the heat. A lot of us do that. But what will happen, is, the other thing is you don't want to mow your lawn when it's in heat stress. But the other thing that will happen in the morning is there's dew on the ground. And when you cut St. Augustine grass that is wet, I don't care how sharp your mower blade is, it shreds the ends of the turf. And those shred marks, which turn brown, not only do they look bad, they open up the turf. They allow disease to directly enter the plant. Just like a cut that you have, you want to cover that with a Band-Aid. Why? So it doesn't get bacteria in there and get infected. It's the exact same thing. So don't mow turf that is stressed. And then along those lines, make sure you do have a sharp, sharp mower blade because you don't want to open the lawn up. Now, good, solid cuts on the lawn are very normal, and those are going to be fine, and those are going to be minimally invasive to the lawn. You have to keep cutting that way. You have to keep with your maintenance. However, we don't want to push the turf to make it grow more, and we'll talk about that as well. Well, in some cases, we actually do, but we'll get into that as we go. But don't mow the turf when it's stressed. Super shot. I'm reading my notes here in case anybody's wondering, because I really I, I really tried to, to really cover a lot of things here, a lot of different areas that don't just relate to disease. And so I did take some notes. Consider trying to air dry the lawn if you can. And this goes to airflow. This will be a big one when we come to Rise Octonia Brown Patch. But pretty much everything else, if you have large trees that are holding in and not allowing a lot of airflow, can you thin those out? That's not just for today's fix, but for later fix. Even go out with your blower in the morning and blow the dew off the ground. Dry it out. Get some airflow in there possibly in some cases you cut a little lower. However, in the case of some diseases, the lower mo mo mode turfs can be more infected by them. So, you know, there's always a give and take. And that's the other thing I want you to realize is there's a give and take with everything you do. You can't just shut it all off. You have to kind of work a strategy knowing that sometimes it's going to hurt here or hurt there, but I know it's going to help down the line. And then the last thing, when you do water the lawn, you water only in the mornings, Prior to sunrise, let the lawn drink, not too early, let the lawn drink, and then when the sun comes up, let it dry that water out of there because, again, airflow. And when you do water, deep, deep and infrequent. Now that you got the basics down, now that you got the the, the part of, of the cultural practices, we call that set, and you feel like you've done your research and you're ready to attack it, let's talk about some common lawn diseases, what turf grasses they affect, and then some of the ways that you can help the lawn recover if you do have that. So the first one I want to talk about is red thread. This is the one I've gotten the most emails on. So, you know, I just got to assume it's something to do with this year's super long, long periods of rain because, uh, you know, red thread does tend to like a little bit cooler temperatures. I will tell you that it's mostly a disease of cool season turf, so perennial rye, Kentucky blue, and fescue. Um, I don't know if I've heard very many or anyone talk about it in warm season turf. And the warm season turf, of course, would be zoysia, St. Augustine, centipede, Bermuda, and of course my favorite, Bahia grass, which Bahia, I'm not going to mention you at all because I don't know that you actually get any lawn diseases, Bahia. So you don't expect a lot of here from Bahia this week. But either way, this one, red thread, cool season turf mostly. Now, here's the thing with that. Red thread is a disease of the leaf. It does not get into the crowns for the most part, and it does not get into the roots and affect them. So therefore, it's only a disease of the leaf. And one of the things that you know happens when you hit your lawn with high nitrogen fertilizer is it grows very quickly. Well, what's growing? Those grass blades, and they are growing up and they are growing quick. So red thread can be pushed out with nitrogen. Now, I don't want you to think that nitrogen on a diseased lawn is going to correct it overnight. And we're going to talk about setting expectations too, because red thread, while it doesn't necessarily always cause long-term damage, even that is defined differently. You know, what is long-term damage? Well, I don't know. You might, if it's a really bad, if you have a severe outbreak or a severe red thread problem in your lawn, it might take six, eight, or even 12 weeks for it to recover, especially if you're coming into summer and we hit a two or three week dry spell where all of the turf is stunted, you have to realize it can't recover if it can't even grow healthy. So you always have to set that expectation right. And I'm telling you that when I say push the disease out with high nitrogen fertilizer, it doesn't mean that you're going to get the same results from the fertilizer that you get when you put it down when there's no disease. It's not like I put it down and 10 days later, boom, it's dark green. No, 
dead grass is dead grass. It doesn't just go away right away. So set your expectation right. And, and I would rather you push it out in spoon feed doses. And we're going to talk about what spoon feeding means and, and fertilizer rates and nitrogen a little bit today. We're going to go down some long roads. So please hang in there. But you want to push it out with dosing of fertilizer. So I'm talking half to three quarter pound now, half to three quarter pound in 12 days, half to three quarter pound in 12 days, really closer to that half pound of nitrogen, low rates every 12 days, bing, 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 push them in there, just get a cycle of growth going, like growing out bad hair, it's almost if you could grow out a bad hair job faster by eating something, you would continually eat it until the hair grew out, and that's what I would want you to do here with this particular disease of red thread is nice small doses of nitrogen, half pound, maybe up to three quarter pound is fine, every 12 days. Now, you're not going to have to do that for too long, as long as you can keep irrigating. However, if you get a dry spell and you're not able to irrigate, you're going to have to go off of that process. But that's the main one. Now, if you also do feel like, hey, my red thread's real bad, I need to do something about it, then you can go ahead and apply some liquid propiconazole. That's really going to be the best. We used to call that Banner Max. And I would spray Banner Max. I did not see too much red thread when I lived in Northwest Indiana, but we would have uh, some outbreaks yearly that would come in, and I would always just go out and spray with Banner Max. It's propiconazole. You can actually get the Bio Advance propiconazole and hose in sprayers. Now I think it's twenty bucks for five thousand square feet. That's going to work great. The reason you want to use a liquid is because again, this is a disease of the leaf. And you'll see, sometimes you can see the pink mycelium in there. They're called sclerotia or all these different terms. But if you do want to spray it, use a liquid so it coats where the disease is present, which is in the leaf structure and in the leaf zone or in the blade zone or whatever you want to call it up in there. So use a liquid. This, these propiconazole products can be applied every 10 to 14 days or 14 days, I believe it is. So you could just do your, your spoon feed of nitrogen and your propiconazole at the same time. But again, I would ask you not to go with the disease route or the disease control route, the propiconazole route, if you don't have to, because... All fungicides are also, in a sense, growth regulators because that's one of the ways that they can help attack the disease, and that will have an effect on the turf. Again, everything is give and take. Just because it says you can spray this on your turf, it doesn't mean the turf won't have a reaction to it. Think of that again. I always put this to analogies of, of us and humans taking different drugs that were prescribed from doctors. There's always a side effect. Now, some turf will be affected by that side effect in different ways than others, and your soil can even contribute to that. But I would just say don't throw down the propagandazole if you don't think you necessarily need it. Go with the working it out through nitrogen. There are also other things you can do. You're going to hear me recommend these throughout, and that is micronutrients. Micronutrients support everything else. So applying micronutrients, we have our microgreen product, which also does have some potassium content in it because potash potassium is also good to aid in disease recovery, and then all of the micros will help. And then next, you want to use sea kelp and humic acid. Sea kelp because it stimulates gibberellins, which stimulate rooting and fresh rooting because that's the other thing we want is we want to get some fresh rooting. Now, it's not the same type of stimulation or push that nitrogen does. This is more of a root and shoot stimulation because, again, more root and shoot, we can support more top growth and more health. And then we want the humic acid because it's a chelator for everything else and it helps to oxygenate the soil, which, again, is good for those roots because everything up top is where it's being affected. So let's make sure the roots are real strong as we're pushing through the nitrogen, as we're trying to push fresh growth and push it out. Those are all the things that you can do to help yourself recover from the red thread. But again, the fertilizing piece of it is the best. Now, just go to the store and get what you want. If you got Carbon X, which we do have in stock now on the site, Carbon X would work great for that. The idea being, get whatever it is that you can and put it down. Get Scott's Turf Builder. I don't care. Summer Guard, whatever it is, put it down and get some nitrogen on there. Low dose, low amounts every 12 days or so. That's really the best way to go. And then the final piece of this goes back to your expectations on how long it's going to take to cure it. And I want you to think about that. It's, it's these areas of dead grass. What can you do to help things move along? Well, you could use the dethatch product. And what dethatch does is it brings, it stimulates the microbes, it's got molasses in it, to feed on dead grass. Well, listen, dead grass can be thatch that's built up over years, but dead grass can be dead grass that died from a disease. And by the way, dead grass in those areas can harbor spores and it can harbor more parts of the disease that can stay moist and can be moved and, and can be you know transferred around. So by using the dethatch to burn out all the dead stuff, you can actually be burning out habitat for the disease spores. Is that the right word, habitat? 
you uh, anyway, you get the idea, you get the analogy, you burn that out of there. I've been using this on Dollar Spot, and we'll talk about that as it comes up in my lawn exclusively. I just let this patches die from the Dollar Spot. I hose it down with the dethatch, and then my stolons just push in fresh. And I don't notice, and I've done the same thing in the zoysia too. It works really good. Little dead spots in the zoysia from Dollar Spots or Dollar Spot. I just hose it in there with the dethatch, and a couple of days later, the stolons or the rhizomes will move right back in there because they're just super small spots that you got to get to pretty early. So lots of fun there. But the idea is have some patience. Let the lawn heal up. It's just like when you get a cut on your skin, it doesn't heal up right away. Some will heal up faster than others. Sometimes you even have scarring there for quite a bit of time for a while. So that's just the idea. It kind of works the same way. All right, now for our next disease... Let's go and talk about Dollar Spot. And I encourage you, if you're listening to this vi these videos, because we break them up as well. I have been the lawn guardian that works with me. He breaks the videos up, and these will be broken up probably by the different disease. But I encourage you to listen to all of them or the full-length podcast. Reason being is because I give tips that are, you know, equate to all the diseases throughout each one. And I just don't want you to miss any of those because they all kind of work together. So there'll be a playlist you can also find. But let's talk about Dollar Spot. This is the one that I have the most experience with. And that's because I would see it almost every year, in fact, I would see it every year when I worked for True Green in Northwest Indiana and then over into Illinois. I used to see it really bad in Orland Park to the fact where it would be uh, spots one day and a week later, all the spots had grown together and it completely manifested into something different. So I have definitely seen Dollar Spot a lot. The good news about Dollar Spot is if you have it, if you're seeing it in your lawn, and it starts as little silver dollar size brown spots, you can see the hourglass lesions on the leaves or on the blades. If you Google search dollar spot lawn disease, I did a video. It was actually in our original project lawn in Crown Point, Indiana at the church. It got dollar spot in the summer, and I showed you exactly what it did and what it looked like. And if you follow that that uh, particular playlist, you'll see the update videos after the dollar spot did not cause long-term damage. And that's a public place that doesn't get any kind of fertilization or anything besides what I was doing, which I kind of even fell off towards the end of the year there. So go check that out. You'll see dollar spot is not a serious problem. However, when you see it, it can definitely send you into panic mode because it does kind of spread. It kind of lives fast and burns out. And as soon as the temperatures dry out in the summer, it'll kind of start to go away. It's really a late spring, early summer kind of deal. But it is also a disease of the leaf. And when we talk about diseases of the leaf, that means we can push them out with good, fast growth. So what I would like you to do there, first thing, when you have Dollar Spot, and again, this is in addition to following the best, best practices that I mentioned earlier on in the podcast about proper mowing and watering and airflow and all of these things. The next thing you want to do here then... Oh, by the way, I just did, wanted to say one of the other ways that you can sometimes identify that dollar spot is coming is you'll see little round spider webs in your lawn in the morning. And what those are is actually the mycelium, and that's the early stages of that dollar spot starting to manifest. Now, in a lot of cases, I would see those mycelium circles in my lawn, but the dollar spot would never do any damage to my lawn because I fed it so fast, everything would just keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. So all I would see would be those little, and I'm using the term spider webs because that's what people think they are. They're little round spider webs that you'll see on your lawn. Cool season turf mostly talking to here. But that's what you would see, and it would just grow through. Now, this disease does affect Kentucky bluegrass and fescue mostly. However, centipede also can be affected, perennial rye and zoysia, St. Augustine as well. Like I said, I've seen it in my lawn. But again, I think this is mostly going to be a disease of finer bladed turf like your cool season and like your zoysia. Now back to it. This is a disease of the leaf, so you can push it out with nitrogen. Same type of deal. I'd like you to give it low dose nitrogen, one half to maybe even three quarter pound nitrogen every 12 days and try to do, you know, if you can keep it down to that half pound, three or four applications in succession, nice and easy. And you should be able to help that to grow out. But very much like red thread. You can do the same other best practices you can apply micronutrients to support healthy growth in the lawn, seek help to stimulate good rooting and healthy shoot and root growth, and humic acid to aerate the soil and chelate nutrients so that way things can be as efficient as possible. These are all things that can be done as well as potassium, which again is also in the OO2 microgreen, but whatever potassium source you can find is also good to aid in recovery from lawn disease. These are all positive ways to help that dollar spot to grow out. If you do want to use a fungicide, same thing here because it's a disease of the leaf, you want to get a liquid propylene 
propiconazole. Now, you possibly could just spot spray the spots if they're not that bad. There's no need for a blanket application here if you don't want to go too crazy, and I've done that many, many times, and that's what I would do for customers that didn't want to wait the dollar spot out because when I worked for True Green, for the most part, we would ask people to wait out the dollar spot. We didn't do preventative fungicide applications. It wasn't something that was in the budget. I don't know if they do nowadays, but we didn't back then, and if people got dollar spot, we would mention it to them, and we would say, we just need you to wait several weeks here. It's going to go away when things dry out, when temps come back. However, customers that were not willing to wait, and we did have some of those, then I would go out with Banner Max, again, propiconazole, and I would spray the areas, saturate them down real well that had the dollar spot in it, and it would go away. It would only take a couple weeks. So again, when it comes to the recovery, there is kind of that waiting period because those dead areas are not going to grow out right away. So you can put some dethatch in there to help eat, help eat those up. But let me explain, you know, kind of how to expect, you know, things to recover. I want you to think about, you know, long-term damage because, we tell people dollar spot doesn't cause long-term damage, but long-term damage to some of you could be two weeks, whereas long-term damage to me is it's not going to recover this season. So for example, if I find you know that you get a ma- major outbreak of grub, uh, grubs, I always call them grub worms because that's keyword people search, but it's just grubs. If you get a massive outbreak of grubs and you get that and you notice that say in late September, early October, I'm talking to folks maybe like in Indianapolis, say sometime around that that longitude, Say you notice that in early October and you have giant areas that are dead. Well, that's long-term damage. That's not coming back. You're going to have to reseed or resod that. It's just not going to come back, right? When I say that's long-term, when I say short-term damage or it doesn't cause long-term damage, that's dollar spot. Yeah, those spots will be there for several weeks. They're going to look ugly, but the lawn will recover as long as you continue feeding it vigorously, continue letting it grow. You know, Kentucky bluegrass is a rhizonymous uh, type grass, so it'll start to spread wide. It'll push out. You know, those are the, you know, proper mowing. It'll recover in time. So that's okay. That's not long-term damage, but it's not two weeks. So set your expectations right that if the dollar spot has really infested heavily and some of those spots have started to grow together, it may take several weeks for that to come back. So just keep that always in mind that putting down this shot of fertilizer I'm telling you to put down isn't going to make it recover by next week. So I know I've mentioned that a few times. I know I keep doing that. Repetition is the key to learning. I just don't want you to think that all these things get recovered overnight. It does take a little bit of time. Okay, now the next thing I want to talk about here, because I've talked about putting nitrogen in for these particular diseases, there are some that will tell you not to fertilize in high nitrogen, but it doesn't mean to cut it off completely. And I think that's where some people get confused is they think, oh, the university extension, which I told you to follow, but you need to interpret it the right way. The university extension says don't apply high nitrogen when you have this disease present. I'm I'm not going to apply any. Well, no, you need to do some. It's just like, again, when you're sick with a disease, you don't feel like eating, you have to eat something to keep your strength up. Well, the, the lawn needs its strength to be kept up. You can't cut it off completely. You just need to do things smartly. And that's where pounds on the ground comes in. But I wanted to just read something to you. This comes from the NC State. Um, This comes from the NC State Turf Files, which is their university extension. And and this is, again, I mentioned this earlier. This is one of the better resources. And this is for brown patch. We're going to get to that later. And again, I'm bringing this up because the last two diseases we talked about, we're using nitrogen to push them out. The next ones, we're not using nitrogen to push them out, but it doesn't mean we're going to not apply. So listen to what this says. This is about brown patch, and it says, do not apply excess nitrogen when conditions favor disease development. In general, cool season grasses should not receive more than one pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet at any one time. So what does that mean? What that's telling you is that a high nitrogen application is one pound or more of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. And that's what you don't want to do when the disease is present. Okay, great. So I get it. We don't want to apply super high nitrogen. The other piece of this, though, comes in is people will read this and they will think, oh my gosh, I did a lot of nitrogen in the spring. I put a lot of nitrogen down. I must have caused the disease. And that is not the case. You did not cause the disease because the alternative would be to not do anything And that goes back to what I talked about in the beginning, that a lawn that doesn't have any fertilization at all, it's not going to look good ever. So you see how, I don't know, I hope I'm explaining this right, but the the second piece of this that I want you to get is, is that the programs that I talk about are not high nitrogen programs. Even though I talk about nitrogen drives the bus and nitrogen is where you want to go and and it it is, but I got to explain to you guys what high nitrogen actually means. 
You have to realize that when I recommend to you to do applications, when I say push it in the spring, the highest application I recommend is three quarter pounds of nitrogen per thousand, which is 0.75. Now, I will tell you there are times when you can push harder, and that's for sure you can. When you're learning, push harder, man. Put some stuff down. Don't do it overall for the entire year, but for your first couple applications, if you need to learn what it feels like to apply, go ahead and throw down heavy. The other thing is, is if you're early in your game and your lawn is super thin and you want to make fast gains, yes, apply hard. Apply three quarter pound every four weeks. If you don't need to make as fast gains, then apply three quarter pound every six weeks. See how that works? But I'm not asking you to apply an entire pound in one time. Now I've done it in my lawn. I actually applied 1.5 pounds of N per thousand in my zoysia and it's beautiful. And the reason I do that is because I want to illustrate to you that one pound of nitrogen is not really that much. But for the most part, a lot of pro companies, at least when I was in the business, Every application we did was one and or one and a quarter pounds or even one and a half pounds of N per thousand. We threw down hard. That's just what we did. And you can even see NC State says that they consider anything one pound or over to be heavy. I don't even do that. I'm a, I'm 25% lower than that in my heaviest applications, which are three quarter pound N. Does that make sense? So if you're on my programs already, you're not throwing down hard, even though you think you are. The way you throw down hard is to throw down once a month rather than throw down once every six weeks, but you're still throwing down a half, three quarter pound of nitrogen each time. And then of course, I tell you guys to back down in summer to half a pound of nitrogen per thousand and then spread it out you, between four and six weeks. It's really that simple. But the idea being that over a pound of nitrogen would be a lot at one time in most cases, but all of my programs are already much lower than that. And actually, I would say they qualify as spoon feeding. Now, NC State talks about going back to that quote I was reading just now. So I'll go back and start it again. Do not apply excess nitrogen when conditions favor disease development. In general, cool season grasses should not receive more than one pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet at any one time. Avoid applying nitrogen to cool season grasses in late spring or summer or use very low rates if necessary. Now, they give a very low rate of one quarter pound of nitrogen per thousand. That's their very low rate. That's really difficult for a homeowner to do with available products because you'd have to apply so small amount. Now, one thing that you can do to get an easy one quarter pound of nitrogen per thousand and get that in low dose is to go to the 1801 Green Punch, which is our liquid product, because I think it's 16 ounces per thousand, delivers one quarter pound of nitrogen. And that's John Perry's philosophy is that spoon feed. So you would do that every four weeks in the summer. Idea being the products that I recommend, the products that I talk about to you guys, which again, I talk about 1801 Green Punch a lot in all of my, my books and everything. Those are low dose. Those are already by default spoon feed type programs. Even though I encourage you to push it hard for a little bit, I also encourage you to start learning how to get those things dialed in so that you can apply lower amounts every four to six weeks. So I'm pretty sure that, that that's coming across and I hope you guys get what I'm saying. But to even back it up a little bit more, I just wanted to show you some readily available things over the counter and what their recommended rates are. So you don't go, Alan, you're, are you sure you know that, that you're recommending this? What, what are some of these other ones? Well, Scott's Turf Builder for Southern Lawns. This is a just a regular lawn food. It's a 3204, and they recommend 2.8 pounds per thousand as their application. And again, this is this has no weed control in it. It has no no uh, you know pre-emergent weed control. It doesn't have any insect control in it. It's just their lawn food, which is what you would use in the summer, right? So their Southern Lawns. It's a 32 percent end product. They recommend 2.8 pounds per thousand. That's 0.9 pounds per thousand of N, of nitrogen. That's Scott's, giant company, lots of scientists, right? Their regular lawn food, which you would use in the summer, is a 0.9 pounds of a nitrogen per thousand recommendation. So almost a pound. I'm under that. So I actually recommend a lower fertility program. Is that the right way to say it? A better spoon feed than Scott's does. Just I'm just giving you some ideas here. Now, Let's go to the actual step three. So if you go to Scott's and you get their actual four step, they'll say this is our best program or whatever. Their actual step three, which they tell you to apply in July or August, their actual step three is a 32% nitrogen product. The app rate is 2.5 pounds per thousand, which is 0.8 pounds per thousand of nitrogen all in one app. So my, my applications are less than that. They are lower than that. They are not as high as that. My summer application rates are 0.5 or half a pound 
per thousand. So I just want you to see, we're not recommending anything or I'm not recommending anything that's super crazy or that's super out of the realm. Just realize that when I talk about throwing down, these are definitely lower amounts just by definition or just by how I've built the programs. They're already lower amounts. I just want to, I feel like sometimes I have to clarify that because people think, ah, Alan Goss, Terrell Christ. I do. I, I obviously talk about things in a certain way. I try to get them get you hyped up and, and all of that. But the truth is, if you follow the guides, if you follow what I tell you, I give you I give you some some encouragement to go a little crazy. I tell you to kind of back it down, keep things going. And that the reason that's important and the reason I'm really bringing all that up is because, again, with all this disease stuff, I just don't want you guys to panic thinking, man, I'm doing something terrible or I caused this disease. No, you didn't. You are not really throwing down that much nitrogen. And if you did, it's okay. You did not cause it but you also want to treat smartly as you move forward. And so that's what we're going to talk about in these next few diseases that we're going to come across. And the next one is called leaf spot, or it's sometimes it's called melting out. Now, I am not an expert with this one. Now, this is different than gray leaf spot, which is something that I work on in my St. Augustine grass. Not an expert there either. In fact, you're not ever going to hear me say I'm an expert on anything. I'm not that, I don't do that. But, but I don't have a lot of experience with leaf spot. But I know enough to read, and I know enough to talk to people that, that have experience with it and kind of talk about a little bit of it. So for the most part, leaf spot and melting out, which it's two different pathogens that affect kind of in succession, the leaf spot will kind of, or the melting out will kind of come first, I think. And then as things get warmer, the leaf spot will come in. They always kind of show up together though. It affects perennial rye, tall fescue, and Kentucky bluegrass. But perennial rye, I think is the one you're going to see it on the most. They also can hit zoysia and Bermuda. And I think if they're low mode, it makes it even more susceptible. Now, this disease is different than the last two we mentioned because this one does actually affect or infect the crowns and the roots, which means pushing nitrogen on it in high rates is going to stress the grass out because nitrogen stimulates the grass to grow. And you don't want to do that when it's sick. It's almost like if you're sick internally and all of a sudden I want to feed you a whole bunch of sugar and then have you go out and run a marathon, it's not going to work. You're going to burn out because you're sick and it's actually going to make you more sick. And that's what can happen when you have these diseases that have this type of of, of a, uh, a mode in which they affect the plant. This also does affect the leaves, obviously, because you see the leaf spot, but it also does get into the crown and into the root. So therefore, we don't want to push it hard, but it doesn't mean we're not going to push it at all, and it doesn't mean that you caused it. That's what I'm trying to say. By fertilizing early in the year, you did not cause it. Now, fertilizing going forward, we're going to be careful, but I don't want you to think anything more than that. All I want you to do is face the problem at hand, and let's go after it. And the first thing is, you definitely want to use a zoxystrobin here. That is going to be Scott's Disease X. That's going to be the very best treatment for this disease is the azoxystrobin. You can get that at any hardware store, you know, Home Depot, whatever, 20 bucks for 5,000 square feet. And you're going to want to use the curative rate, which is four pounds per thousand. So actually at that curative rate, I don't think it'll cover 5,000 square feet. You'll need to do the math. I don't have the bag rates in front of me here, but four pounds per thousand. And you want to apply every 14 days while you're seeing the disease present. Now, as it starts to burn out, you can stop obviously with the disease problem and then you or with the disease X and you can move into more, you know, disease or uh, uh, dead spot repair, which would be using the dethatch and things like that. But the idea there is definitely when you get this one, if it is starting to, to manifest in a, in a way that you're seeing the visible damage from it, use the azoxystrobin. From here, definitely don't put any more nitrogen fertilizer down for several more weeks. Your lawn is going to be fine. We just don't, again, want to burn it out. But it doesn't mean you're not going to fertilize at all for the rest of the year. Instead, what you want to do is move to micronutrients. Micronutrients are going to help support photosynthesis, help support the plant in general and all of its systems and functions. Just like I always say, seek help and humic acid for the soil and healthy shooting and rooting. And then any type of potassium you can get. Again, OO2 microgreen has it. Nice low doses of potassium in there would also be helpful to help that lawn recover. You know, you want to do the regular cultural practices we talk about, you know, catching your clippings, only water in the mornings, deep and infrequent, all of those things we've been talking about, sharp blades, don't mow the grass when it's under stress. Let it kind of work its way out and work its way through. The idea being is you want to control the controllables. There's going to be things that you can't control. Let's talk about watering, for example. You know, if Mother Nature decides to give you a storm at eight o'clock at night, which happens all the time throughout the Midwest, does that mean that 
Mother Nature broke the watering rule and she's trying to kill your grass? No, it's just the type of things that happen. So you control what you can and let the rest work itself out. By the way, if you are getting thunderstorms, that's great because that's good natural free nitrogen that can keep everything rolling while this disease works itself out. But in the long and the short of it, with the leaf spot and the melting out, the idea here is to kick in your cultural practices, kick in your mowing, kick in your watering the proper way, keep the azoxystrobin going, keep it moving, and this should clear itself out by the time you get to midsummer. If you need to clear out the disease quicker, use the dethatch to eat up anything that died, any dead spots. The dethatch will eat that up and it will keep that lawn or hopefully help to dry it out or help not allow things to, to harbor there. Uh, that's the idea with that, and that's what that dethatch can do. And then the other products to keep the soil healthy. Those are the types of ideas that you want to follow with leaf spot. Now, the next one is gray leaf spot. This one's different. This is a different pathogen than what you're going to see with the previous leaf spot and melting out we talked about. I actually get this one in my St. Augustine, and it's pretty much there in small amounts everywhere all summer. It never really manifests. I'll just see some leaf, some spots on the leaves. I know that's gray leaf spot here and there, but it doesn't, the lawn still looks great. It doesn't kill anything. Nothing dies. That's because my lawn is constantly moving. You know, in the spring and the fall, when I'm allowed to fertilize, I push it hard and it just pushes the leaf spot right out. And this is, again, I don't necessarily want to tell you that if you have gray leaf spot, you need to go and fertilize. But what I do want to tell you is, is if you have gray leaf spot and you have St. Augustine grass and you're just following a generally good, healthy program of applications like I talk about, it shouldn't become a problem. It should just grow through. It should just work its way through. It shouldn't cause any type of damage. Now, I will tell you, though, that I notice it getting really bad on my St. Augustine. By the way, this can also get into Bermuda, centipede, fescue, and ryegrass, this gray leaf spot, but I, I have the most experience with it on my St. Augustine grass, but I will tell you that where it will manifest is if I cut my lawn when it's wet in the morning and there's dew. Every time I do that, I get this really weird shredding of my grass blades. Doesn't matter how, how sharp my mower blade is. When I cut it wet, that St. Augustine, you get these brown shreds at the end. That will exacerbate the leaf spot. It'll get much worse because the pathogen then I guess is just spreading because it's getting into those injured spots and it can get really bad. But again, I'm not pushing anything extra on it, but my lawn is still pushed. It keeps growing. Even in the summer, we have all this lightning that comes in and keeps the lawn growing really fast. I'm still, I haven't fertilized my lawn since the very beginning of May where I put the Carbon X over there and we're already at the end of June and I still have to mow every three or four days. If you subscribe to my channel, you're going to see this weekend, I actually did a video comparing the Toro Time, no, the Toro Super Recycler and the Honda HRX. That's coming out Sunday. My son helped me film it. I was at six days of growth and way overgrown. You'll see it terrible. And I haven't fertilized that area over there uh, in, in two months. It's just how things grow. Now, do I want to say Carbon X is awesome? Yeah, the color still looks good. But really what it is, is we just get so much rain and lightning, at least we have here for the last several weeks. It keeps my lawn growing fast. And that just keeps that leaf spot growing out of there. And of course, I'm supporting my lawn with healthy things. I'm keeping the soil healthy. I keep micronutrients in there, which I did an application of those last week. The micronutrients just help everything to kind of move. It all works together. I just don't think leaf spot is something that you need to be super concerned about. Just let it kind of do a thing. If it does get really bad for some reason, if gray leaf spot really starts to take your lawn over, then again, you're going to use a double application here. You're going to use my bulletproof strategy, but you're going to use it in a curative manner, and you're going to use propiconazole and azoxystrobin together, and you can apply both of those every 14 days, but it shouldn't take you more than a couple apps, and that should clear right up. And just to put a bow on this, to go back to it, when you have gray leaf spot, I'm not telling you to push a ton of nitrogen, but this is one of those cases where I'm telling you that that half a pound of nitrogen that I typically talk about you applying in the summer is fine. Just keep with that. Maybe you separate those by six weeks instead of four. Just use that. You can use malorganite if you want. You can use Ringer Lawn Restore, whatever you want to find. Just nice, low, steady doses in the summer if you have gray leaf spot. Should keep it pushing out. Not going to be a problem. Now, the last one I want to talk about is brown patch or rhizoctonia. Now, this one I have seen in my zoysia. I had some spots earlier this season, and I have seen it in St. Augustine all throughout my neighborhood. I think I might have had one or two areas that got a little infected, but not too bad. Uh, you'll see those in videos if you go back into like January, February in my catalog. You probably see a couple spots I showed you that I got. But other than that, I haven't seen it, but I've seen it in a lot of St. Augustine lawns around my neighborhood here. However, I will tell you that turf type tall fescue and zoysia get affected the hardest or the worst or are the most susceptible in a lot of cases, followed there, followed then by St. Augustine and Centipede. It also can get into rye and bluegrass. So this is one of those brown patch that can affect almost all of the grass types except for Bahia grass. 
So the way you'll know brown patch is these irregular kind of splotches that show up. I mean, you got to Google pictures of it because it, it manifests a little bit differently in different grass types, depending how it moves. I've mentioned before, I'll see it move around by where water flows. And so the first thing is, if you think you have brown patches, I want you to get out and start taking pictures immediately. One of the things I've talked about with disease is your expectation on the recovery from the disease. And if you don't take pictures or have a history, all you're going to think is, oh my gosh, this looks bad every day. But if you have a history, if you've, if you've taken pictures, you will actually be able to see the progression. It's kind of like taking for granted someone that's beautiful after you look at them for long periods of time. Maybe they just don't look as beautiful as they used to. Boy, that's a terrible analogy. It can work the opposite with the lawn, though. It can look worse and worse and worse and worse and worse to you over time because all you notice is the bad. But in reality, it may actually be getting better. So if you do think this goes for all the diseases, but especially with brown patch because of the way it moves and the way it progresses and because of the kind of severe quick damage that it can do, you want to start taking pictures of that right away. Now, I want to go back because I had mentioned this before when I talked about NC State and what they consider to be high nitrogen, but for sure with brown patch, if you have brown patch in your lawn, you do not want to apply nitrogen going forward unless it's in very low dose amounts because you don't want your entire lawn to go without any type of fertilizer. So you want to keep the amounts really, really low dose. And so here is what NC State says. If you have rhizoctonia or or if you think rhizoctonia or brown patch may be a problem because this one overwinters. So if you get it this year, your chances are you're going to get it next year. Here's what NC State says when it comes to brown patch. Do not apply excess nitrogen when conditions favor disease development. In general, cool season grasses should not receive more than one pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet at any one time. So if you've been on my programs and you're, and you're in North Carolina and disease has been prevalent or could have come up and you're applying 0.75 pounds of nitrogen every four to six weeks all through the spring, you are fine. You did not break this rule. You did not do anything wrong. You did not cause your brown patch. You did not do anything to make it hit your lawn. So for the most part, when you have rhizoctonia brown patch in your lawn, just stop with the nitrogen fertilizer until it, until it starts to go away. You can apply, though, micronutrients. You can apply sea kelp, humic acid, all the things we've been talking about primarily. And then you also want to apply some potassium. OO2 microgreen has that I keep mentioning. And then with this one, you definitely want to do what you can to create air movement. Can you trim your trees? Can you get out with your blower and blow the dew off the lawn in the morning? What is it that you can do to help create some airflow? Because you're going to notice that rhizoctonia is going to be in areas where the airflow is restricted, maybe with shade or dappled sun. Those are the types of things that can make it worse. So what can you do to help clear that out and get some airflow in there would be another one. And then for sure, your approach here, when it comes to uh, fertile or when it comes to fungicides, azoxystrobin and propiconazole, both together every 14 days using, using the curative rate. And you want to keep applying those liberally, I mean, as, as instructed on the label. And that can really help to slow that rhizoctony down, stop it, and help that lawn recover. Now, once it stops, once you notice that it isn't spreading anymore, which is why it's important to take these pictures and things are starting to dry out. By the way, cloud cover also contributes to this. So once you get bright sunlight to help dry some of that out of there, then you can pick up your fertilizing again, but it's probably going to be midsummer, so you're not going to want to pick up too fast or too hard. You're going to want to go with low doses of nitrogen. But as always, you want to try to keep airflow in there. That's the key with Rhizoc is to keep that airflow in there as much as possible. And then of course, if there are any dead areas that are scarred that you want to help clear up faster, just because it'll help you see some results, spray dethatch on the dead spots or on the diseased spots or on the scars. And that will help to eat up that dead grass and keep taking your pictures and watch how fast the recovery happens. Okay, now I have one question that came in on email that I wanted to go over this week. It's growing grass on a hillside. So it's kind of important to talk about this one's something that's actually come up on YouTube this week that I'll point you to. But this one comes from Brian and Brian is in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he says, Alan, I wanted to get some advice and maybe start up a conversation regarding a lawn restoration. I'm about to attempt. I'm a U.S. Marine that just purchased my first house outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. This house has it all except the epic lawn that I have always wanted to achieve. The main issue being that the front lawn lays on a slope of hard clay. And when I say slope, it's a bit steep, but I can still mow it without the wheels sliding or it becoming a safety issue. The previous homeowner failed to in getting grass to stay put over the years. I think he just let it go and eventually it washed away and now there is more weeds than grass. Now, I'm going to skip because he talks about some different treatments. He's been doing liquid. He's been doing some fertilizer. He took soil samples. All good things. He's getting prepared. He's been doing some things. And he says here, however, 
as I have been watching things closely out there, I wonder if I have been wasting money, wondering if granular products in particular are just washing off the slope, if the nutrients are even remaining in the soil at the top of the incline. So that's the first question is, is stuff just washing off? Now, the second piece he says is, there's no real good information out there on doing what everyone else is doing, but on an incline, and I want to set this up for success instead of a trial and error type situation. Would hate to spend hundreds of dollars seeding the slope and have it all end up washing into the gutter I have not, and have nothing to show for past year's efforts. I am open to any and all suggestions, even a change in turf seed that you think might be better for this situation. I enjoy the videos and your relentless pursuit of an epic lawn that is the envy of everyone in the neighborhood. Keep up the good work and stay motivated, Brian. Brian, congratulations, Marine. Congratulations on your house, my brother. Two things that he's got going on here. The first thing is, generally as speaking, he's applying products with this slope. And he's wondering, hey, what, what's going on there? What's happening with those? And then the second thing is he's going to have to seed the slope itself. Seems like he's got grass up top and down below maybe. But the slope itself, the hill itself, doesn't have grass. It's just weeds because that's a tough thing. So I want to think about it before we break that down because I got, I got a, a, an example you can look at this week. But the first key is, is that he said the slope is manageable and it can be mowed. And, and thank you, Brian, for pointing that out because that's – an extremely smart point. If you can't mow it, you don't grow grass there. So he can mow it, so he can grow grass there. If you have a slope that's so steep that you can't mow it safely or properly or, or consistently, you cannot get a good cut on it, then I would recommend you maybe put in some retaining walls and try to flatten it out and stair-step it. Or don't grow grass. So I just wanted to point that out. The first thing Brian realizes is he can mow it so good, we can move forward. So when we look at this and break this down, the first thing is, Am I wasting my money fertilizing? So if you guys go to Jake the Lawn Kid's channel, Jake the Lawn Kid is my buddy. He was my neighbor up there in Northwest Indiana. We have a project lawn that we were working on, but I dumped it off on him just because I can't be up there all the time and said, all right, Jake, this is all up to you, buddy. <laughs> and uh, he took care of it. Now, the last time we were there, we applied pre-emergent, and we also applied some Melorganite, which is a fertilizer product. But the thing is, if you guys remember, the project lawn has a steep slope in the front barely able to mow it. Like the homeowner, when he first started mowing, he said, oh, I kind of felt a little, you know, I had to crunch up a little bit, but he, he's good now. He can mow it. He's figured out a safe way to do it and he can get a good cut on it. So Jake and I were working on that. Now, the reason I'm mentioning Jake is he's got an update on his channel from this week of that project lawn, but, and he shows you what he did and what, what I did a little bit of it, but he did most of it. But basically what happened was after we applied the malorganite, and he went back a few weeks later with all the rain and everything and the slow releasing of the malorganite. The malorganite had washed into holes, low spots. It had washed down actually where they had dug some gutters or, or, or downspouts under the ground to, to take roof water away, which is a good thing. Those had sunk a little bit, and the malorganite had settled into some of those trenches, I guess you would say. And so what you had was this splotchy lawn, and Jake shows pictures of it on, on his channel, and you can actually see where the malorganite washed down the hill in a way and uneven. So the strategy from there was, all right, well, then what you're going to have to do is treat the, the slopes with liquids. And he started using the 1801 green punch. The reason that you treat the slopes with liquid is because liquid is the smallest particle you can get. So it absorbs pretty much immediately. And in fact, if you apply 1801 green punch with a hose and sprayer, that's counted as watering in. You'll get some foliar absorption, which is obviously good, but it's pretty much there. It's in the soil. It's on the soil. Maybe a little misting to get it down, in the, but it's not going to wash away from that point. And you can see the results that Jake got when he shows you how the lawn looks now. It's it's evened out almost completely. And, and you know, this is a 17-year-old kid out there just spraying and praying, and he actually solved that problem. So the question being, Yes, granulars can wash away. They can wash down. For sure they can. We're going to give an update on Leonard from Peoria here in the end because he's the guy that called in about malorganite splotches a couple weeks ago. I've been talking to Lenny. We got a, some updates there for you guys as well. But the long and the short of it is, Brian, I would recommend that for the sloped areas, you go ahead and switch to liquids, whatever that means for you, because liquids are going to work a lot better. They're not going to wash around or wash away. Now, can things wash out of the soil, he also asked, because I'm mainly talking about granulars that will wash over the top. Now, anytime there's water that is saturating in through or moving through soil, for sure, it's going to take things out. It's also going to bring things in. But for sure, anytime water is moving through soil, it's going to have an effect on it. Now, does it have an effect greater on a slope? Probably. But slopes have other challenges in that they get, beat, they get beaten with the sun differently. Roots have to grow differently in a slope, so they kind of hold the slope differently. 
and, and really it's the, the soil that's holding the plant in. It's not the other way around. But all of these things kind of work against it. So for sure, what you would want to do next is if you do have a situation where you have downspouts that are contributing to flow across the hill, you want to get rid of that. You want to dig in, dig those downspouts in and under and out. You don't want to have any extra water flowing over that hill if you can help it. So those are the two tips that I would give you there as far as the way fertilizing goes is switch to liquids and reduce whatever water flow across the hill that you can. Now, the second piece then would be, what am I going to do to seed on the slope? And you have a couple different choices. Now, if you can sod it, I think sod is a good idea. Tack it in. But I don't know if necessarily know you mentioned seeding. And I think seeding is probably going to be a more economical type deal. So you're going to have to go and get erosion mats. That's just what you're going to need to do. And that's what I recommend. Now, you could try hydro seeding. Hydro seeding will stick. And maybe you even want to try both hydro seed and erosion mats. But I would definitely recommend that you go to your local landscape supply. This isn't going to be a Home Depot type project. Go to your local landscape supply that supplies landscapers in your area and ask them for, and I'm going to use the word here, professional erosion mats. I don't know what that exactly means, but you want to get something that professionals are using because I see them seeding the sides of slopes all the time, the sides of the highway here, the sides of on-ramps and off-ramps with these giant erosion mats. And those work very well. And those areas are not watered. They're not, but those work well. That's what you're going to want to do. I would check out definitely hydro seeding and I would check out erosion mats and whatever you can do to get that seed to stick in there. I also would not kill off the weeds. I'd cut them a little bit shorter, but I would not kill them off because you're going to want those weeds that are in there when you seed in the fall to help hold things in as well. So erosion mats are what you have to go with. If you can't sod it, erosion mats, hydro seeding, look into those types of things. And that should help you when you do your seed in the fall time to keep the seed from washing away. And then from there, that's when you can go into the fertilizing. And I recommend the fertilizing be done with liquids. And then of course, do what you can with the mowing. So again, Brian, congratulations on that house out there. Let me know how things go. And as always for you, brother, we're going to be hoping for the best. By the way, I did want to mention, if you're looking for someone else that's also been taking care of grass on a slope, check out Ben the Lawn Guardian's channel. He's got a fairly decent slope in his backyard. It's one that I wouldn't want to have to deal with. And his backyard is double dark and really green. Now, I think he uses granular, but he's got a lot of turf back there, and the, the turf itself can hold the granular in place. He also does use some liquids and a lot of other things, but I'm just saying, if you're looking for a YouTube channel of somebody that deals with a slope, go check out Ben the Lawn Guardian and check out his different uh, videos that he does in his backyard. Now, this next one I wanna do is a follow-up from Lenny from Peoria, Leonard. Now, he, he called in a couple weeks ago and he had talked about when he applied Melorganite that he would get splotches in different areas. And I, I hadn't seen any pictures of that time or whatever. I just listened to the phone call. I'll link that description below. If you're on YouTube, you can check out that per piece of that video. But if you just Google search splotches, malorganite application splotches or splotches after malorganite applications, if you just YouTube search that, you'll find the video in his original question. But he and I kind of followed up a little bit here recently and I got some more information and then he called back in and here is what he said. Hey, Alan, this is Leonard from Peoria again. You absolutely hit the nail on the head. I didn't even realize it. The uh, the dark spots after the malorganite application are actual, not not like super low spots, but they are definitely low spots in a lawn that I take for granted. My lawn is not one grass type by any means. It's This is the first house I've ever owned, and it's definitely a, a Franken lawn with a little bit of everything. And I haven't noticed the spots until this year when we get a huge amount of rain all at once. I know the Illinois River has been a flood stage for over a month now. So I appreciate your answer. Um, do you have any solution as to fixing uh, minor low spots in the lawn? I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Bye. Okay. And then actually Lenny sent me a few pictures and we emailed back and forth. He's actually got a couple different things going on. But first thing is, as far as the, the low spots are in the lawn, Lenny, you're going to want to use sand. It's just the best thing. I know there's all kind of controversy. If you guys go to Connor Ward's channel, he doesn't listen to this podcast, so he'll never know I talk about him. And if he does listen, he definitely doesn't listen this far through. But either way, if you go to his uh, channel, he's got a, 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 a really nice video on leveling the lawn. He's got a big dragger he pulls out there. You know, he's a savage, but it's sand. And people like to make fun of him and say, oh, yeah, you put all that sand in there. You know what you're doing to your lawn? You're going to turn it to concrete. Well, that is not true, and it's, it's just not going to happen, right? Sand is the very best leveling agent. It always is. So just get some play sand, whatever you can find locally, and just kind of rake that into the low spots over time. You don't have to do this all in one day. Do a little bit here, a little bit there, bada beep, bada boop. You'll help to level out those spots, and you'll definitely notice it when you're mowing, but you want to go slow and low. He does this all in one day. 
you don't have to do that, but sand is your leveling agent for your low spots. Now, based on the pictures that Lenny sent, though, he's also got a couple other things going on. One is he's got an old school lawn. He's, he kind of goes into a little bit more about this uh, in some of the emails we have, and he says, my house is what used to be called a starter house, and the lawn had gone through an extended period of disrepair before I purchased it. This led to an influx of all sorts of weeds and grass types, everything from KBG to clumping tall fescue, which is the bane of my existence. So he's got an old school lawn. He's got a lawn that's, you know, changed hands probably a few times a lot of different things happen to it and so some of the areas that he points out where you can see they're dark or blue that are not low spots are actually just where someone repaired a spot or a patch and you have an old school lawn so who knows what the original lawn was who knows what's been thrown in there over the years or not who knows what what survived from the original lawn what didn't and now you have somebody come in and they patch up a spot maybe they cut a tree down at some point something sat there too long killed a spot so they came in they grabbed some patch master or whatever's in that or whatever seed they could find at the store they filled that in and now you have this literal area that you can just see it's just a different type of grass from somebody probably just doing a seeding job right there so that area Area has turned a little bit darker blue green than some other areas. Now, the other thing that he has when I look across is he has some Poa Trivialis. It might be Poa Anua, but I think it's Poa Trivialis. Now, this has been, I have a video I did on Poa Trivialis panic. I don't, I don't want to get too much into the Poa Trivialis, Poa Anua thing. It's one of the most stressful times of the year for me because there's just no good answer for it. But it is in a lot of lawns. It's in a lot of old school lawns because it was in a lot of seed mixes for years, especially if somebody thought they might have had a shade problem or whatever. It was in that. Poa trivialis is, is rough stalk bluegrass. It's not an annual. It's a perennial, but, but it fades in summer, and it'll turn this yellow. It'll go dormant. It'll even turn brown and lay down. And when you see Poa trivialis starting to check out in a lawn from heat, it looks like disease a lot because it gets real splotchy and yellowy, but the problem is, or the challenge is, the grass around it that's regular Kentucky bluegrass is nice and dark and looking good, and so it looks like disease in the lawn when really it's just Poa trivialis just fading out in the summer, or Poa anua that's died. He's got some of that in there. So a lot of different things going on. However, it still goes back to the original thought, which was, there are some low spots, and the malorganite at that high application rate, and the, as much rain as they've had, it does wash that into the low spots. And then if that's been happening over successive years, those low spots, the soil will be much healthier there because it's just gotten more organic. So level those areas out, Lenny, with a little bit of sand if you can here and there. Maybe switch to some liquids. Maybe switch to something that isn't all slow release, like the you know the malorganite, or that's a lower, how should I say, lower con or a higher concentration, something that can 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 get in there with less granules or less chance of washing around into those low spots. And then some of the other spots he had, again, he talks about clumping tall fescue. That will definitely have a darker appearance than a lot of different parts of the lawn. So lots going on there with the old school lawn. As far as that goes, Lenny, something you're going to deal with. But overall, the lawn doesn't look that bad. In the pictures that he sent me, I can tell he's been caring for it and things are looking good. He's just dealing with some things. But I think really the biggest problem that you have there, and this is with a lot of you guys, is that dead or dying or, or fading Poa trivialis in the lawn. So I hate to end on a negative note like that because, man, that's a terrible one. And I promise you when I say Poa trivialis and Poa annua cause me a lot of stress every year, they do. So we're going to work on some strategies coming up in the fall. As I mentioned earlier, that maybe take away from the mechanical aeration and the overseeding uh, in that regard. Maybe we work on pushing lawns to just continue getting thicker. Just like we do in spring, we push them. Maybe we'll just keep pushing them in the fall. Maybe we'll offer some new strategies. I don't know. A lot of different things that we can talk through. I'd really be interested in your feedback if that's something you're interested in. But definitely, I will not recommend burning down lawns and starting over. I just don't recommend that. There are things in the lawn for a reason. We need to let those stay there while we bring in new things and bring them along and get them going. With all that said, I'm Alan Hayne, The Lawn Care Night. I really hope that this podcast has been helpful to you. I feel like the cadence is probably a little bit different. Again, I'm inside my studio here. Got a lot going on. Was out of the was out of the root the loop with it as far as I missed another week. But I promise you, coming up here and all over the summer, we're going to go back to the every week. We'll get the cadence back. We'll get things rolling again, and we will keep those tips going. If you do want to call in, 833-LCN-TIPS. I'm Alan Hayne, The Lawn Care Night. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the lawn.